As you know, the cliché, a picture is worth a thousand words, has been around for a long time. For computer-mediated communication, pictures, moving, static, or word, are the primary presentation aid options. You likely know how to design your aids, but actually using them requires more thought and practice than you may expect. This video will focus on how to use your computer-generated aids, like PowerPoint, while you are delivering an oral presentation. While the majority of this information is directed toward computer-mediated communication presentations, such as live via computer and video via computer without a live audience, most of this information can also be applied to face-to-face -face presentations, a traditional speech in front of a live audience. Specifically, we'll focus on knowing your speaking situation, including your audience, where to look, adapting your speaking style and speed, and adapting your word choice. And we'll end with a warning for those who post their videos for general consumption. Knowing your situation starts with knowing your audience. Who you are speaking to affects not only the design of your aids, but also the formality of your delivery while using them. Speaking to a group of friends requires a much less formal delivery than addressing your colleagues at work, which is also likely to be less formal than if your supervisor or clients are in the audience as well. Consider as well the overall situation. A planned webinar, especially one that is likely to be recorded and distributed, calls for a different delivery style than an informal meeting set up like a discussion. A one-time presentation that is not recorded will still require a lot of attention, but you'll need to prepare more if your presentation is going to be recorded and viewed by different audiences. And of course, a face-to-face -face speech in front of a live audience carries its own rules. While presenting, you need to pay attention to your eye contact. In a face-to-face -face live presentation, you really do need to look at your audience, not your aides, and connect with their eyes. It's called eye contact for a reason. You should only briefly glance at the projection screen to check that what you think the audience is looking at, and you are talking about, is really being displayed. In a CMC situation, eye contact is still important if your face is going to be seen during the presentation, because you are the aide. If you will be what some call a talking head, where your face is front and center on the screen, the audience needs to feel as if you are looking right at their eyes. In this case, you need to practice making eye contact with the camera or webcam while speaking. Think about it. In a typical face-to-face -face speaking situation, you look directly into people's eyes, not at their chin, which is about where your eye gaze would be if you change your focus from the camera to your computer screen and the eye focus is more obvious if you move your head as well as your eyes. Naturally, you'll want to glance at the screen occasionally, but again, glance. You shouldn't be looking at your aids during the entire presentation. This means you will likely have to practice expanding your peripheral vision so you can see the aids on your screen. And just like anything, it will take concentration and practice. And it's a lot simpler if you use a large font size and bulleted phrases on your slides. Even if your webcam image is shown at the side or bottom of someone's computer screen, your audience can still tell when you are looking down, around, or not at the screen. One way to practice is with personal video calls on your smartphone. Rather than looking at the person's face, or your own, on the screen, focus your attention on the camera lens. And yes, it will feel awkward until you get the hang of it. Now, if you are showing something on the screen, it's expected that you have to look at what you are doing. But when you are done showing and are having a discussion, look at the webcam. Realize that most people prefer others to talk with them rather than at them. So you should strive for a conversational speaking style rather than a stilted, formal, memorized, or reading sounding one. This is true regardless of if the presentation is given face to face, live online, or recorded online. It might help if you think about public speaking as enlarged conversation. If you are communicating via a video conference in an informal setting, like a professor holding online office hours, you'll likely use an impromptu speaking style. If it's a more structured presentation like a webinar, you'll probably be using an extemporaneous style. What's the difference? Impromptu means that you've had little or no preparation and were not expected to be prepared. Extemporaneous, on the other hand, means that you are very well prepared, but you haven't memorized your word order. You are thoroughly familiar with the organization and content of your presentation and just need a few glimpses at an outline to keep you on track. And there are times you might script out what you are saying. If you are posting your video on YouTube for the entire world to see, 
You probably want to write out what you plan to say word for word, even memorizing portions if necessary. How do you sound conversational? Here are some hints that may help, regardless of whether you are reading off a script or speaking extemporaneously. Visualize yourself talking to a friend, letting your facial expressions and gestures flow with your words. Again, your eye contact is on the audience, not your presentation aids. Practice your presentation while using your aids, actually saying the words aloud to hear how they come out of your mouth. Reading it in your mind doesn't do the same thing. If you're going to read off a script, practice reading aloud in general as well as with the particular script. You'll likely discover some words or word combinations that you have difficulty with. One of mine is similarly, so I often rewrite a sentence to eliminate it. Sometimes I warm my mouth up with tongue twisters. Sally sells seashells down by the seashore. And record and listen to yourself, even if it hurts. Most people cringe at the sound of their own voice, myself included. But the only way to improve is to observe, revise, and practice. Get used to reading ahead or being able to glance at your notes or slides without having to stare at them. Aaron Dowd, who bills himself as the podcast dude, recommends standing while you are reading a script as well as doing at least two minutes of breathing exercises before starting. These suggestions can apply to situations beyond podcasts. Dowd also warns in his words that you're going to suck for a while. The way not to suck is to practice every day forever. Related to sounding conversational, don't just read what you have on the screen. We read faster than most people speak, so the likelihood is that your audience has probably finished reading your slide before you are even halfway through it. Don't believe me? Professional speaker and podcast host Lisa B. Marshall reports that the conversational speed of the average American English speaker is approximately 110 to 150 words per minute. Compare that with the results of a speed reading test sponsored by Staples, the office supply store, that was referenced in a 2012 Forbes magazine article. The average reading speed for third graders was 150 words per minute, at the top of the average speaking speed range. And if you are speaking to anyone with higher than a third grade education, their reading speeds will significantly outpace your speaking speed. The average adult reads at about 300 words a minute. That's another reason to design your aids to have fewer words and more visual images. While we're on the topic of speed, how fast you speak will also depend on the situation. If you are instructing and live, you will speak slower than if your audience is able to stop and replay your video. I tend to speak fairly fast on these videos, clocking about 190 words a minute, knowing that my students want to get through this fast and can stop and rewind or rewatch if necessary. And if your audience is familiar with the content or have seen the slides in advance, or if the information you are providing seems like common sense, you can probably pick up the pace. And remember that many people, myself included, fiddle with the speed controls. I tend to listen to videos at double time, but then again I was trained as a debater and had to listen to academic debaters moving along at 350 to 500 words per minute, an estimate provided by the Cross-Examination Debate Association. That leads us to this next point. Regardless of the situation, you'll need to be prepared. That means knowing what aids you will be using and the order in which you have them, as well as really knowing what you are talking about so you can add to the content on your aids. If you weren't the one who designed your aids, you really need to spend some time knowing what you will be showing and when. Actually, you should still look them over even if you did design your aids. If you created them a while ago, you may have forgotten what they look like and the order that you have things in, so checking them over is a must. It might help if you print handouts of the slides for yourself, perhaps three per page with room for notes or six per page with just the slides. Sometimes I print these handouts to a PDF file so I can access them on my tablet, which reduces any paper wrestling sounds when I present. Get familiar with any animations or slide transitions. You'll look pretty silly if you let your surprise show when you encounter something unexpected or are constantly saying, oops, I guess we already talked about that. And you can note any animations on the handout pages you printed out. You may want to practice some answers to potential questions you might get. And tell your audience if you want them to hold their questions until the end or ask them when they think of them. Practice saying, that's a great question and I'll be talking about that in a bit so you can get through the presentation without having to skip through your slides unless you really want to, and that will take practice too. 
You can add some additional just-in-case slides at the end of your slide deck or prepare an appendix to send out to your audience. Remember, you want to keep the presentation on point without too much extraneous information. Hit the high points and provide the details later. Preparation may also involve setting up your computer if you're going to show something. If you know your conference call is going to focus on an advertisement you created, have that advertisement open or easily accessible so you can get to it quickly when the time comes. And think ahead as to what you will need. If you are going to explain how to create a pie chart in Excel, you'll probably want to have the data already set up in a worksheet as well as what the final product looks like so you can be as efficient as possible during the presentation. One last thing in this section. If your audience is going to see your computer screen, you may want to clean up your desktop. That means getting rid of or hiding your documents and computer programs and making sure you don't have distracting wallpaper. Mine's not too bad, but it could probably be cleaned up a little more. That may mean you need to clean up the environment behind you so your camera or webcam doesn't show a distracting or inappropriate background. Your goal is to have your audience focus on the presentation and not be distracted by things you can control. Let's move next to what you actually say while you are using your aids. First, realize that you will make mistakes in word choice, in what you click on your screen, and so on. Don't draw attention to those mistakes unless they are really obvious. Please don't say, I'm sorry, or something similar. What to do when you make a mistake? If it's small, keep going and don't acknowledge it. Your audience probably didn't even notice it. If the mistake is more obvious, make light of it, perhaps saying, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Everyone makes mistakes, even professionals. Work on eliminating, or at least reducing, those fillers, ahs, ers, you knows, and so on. Most public speaking teachers will tell you to eliminate them entirely, but interestingly enough, there is some research that says they're not as bad as we think. The key is to make them less distracting. You'll have to work on removing them from your regular conversation, or you won't have a chance of reducing them during your oral presentations. Remember that your aides are supposed to aid the presentation, not act as a slideshow, so please refer to them at times, even if it's a boring, this next slide addresses type of transition. A call back to knowing your audience. If there is a possibility of someone with no or low vision in your audience, watch your word choice when referencing something on the screen. If you say, look here or in this section, they can't see here, there, this or that. At the very least, direct your audience's attention to a specific part of the screen, like to the American Cancer Society logo in the upper right hand corner. A quick demonstration. Close your eyes while I explain the difference between a mole and skin cancer or melanoma, thanks to the American Cancer Society. Are they closed? Okay. Notice that this mole is pretty even while this one is not. And look over here where you can see that this one is larger than that one. Get the picture? You'll see 10 of them when you open your eyes to see the A, B, C, D, and E's of identifying melanoma. The mole on the far left in the top row is the normal mole and looks pretty even on both sides. It's symmetrical as compared to the one, the melanoma, below, which doesn't look the same on each side. It's asymmetrical. If I were really trying to teach you how to detect skin cancer, I would want to spend time actually describing each attribute and not assume you can get the information just by looking at the screen. The final issue relates to the feedback you may get on your videos. If you post your videos to YouTube or a similar video sharing site, you may want to disable the comments, especially if your video is posted in YouTube. No matter how good your video is, you'll get some negative, and let's face it, nasty comments. And that will depend on the platform. In a study published in the 2014 peer-reviewed journal PLOS One, the authors noted differences in the comments related to TED Talk videos and YouTube. More than six times as many YouTube comments were personal insults as compared to TED Talk feedback, 6% versus less than 1%. And for some reason, when the presenter is female, the comments tend to be more emotional in nature and address the characteristics of the presenter rather than the content of the presentation. Oh, and redundancy may be important, which is why I'm reminding you of what we've talked about. Knowing your audience in the speaking situation, where to look, adapting your speaking style and speed, adjusting your word choice, and not getting discouraged by feedback. Hopefully this will help you become a better speaker, whether you use presentation aids or not.